Welcome everyone, join us today as we deep dive into the life and legacy of Steve Marriott, the powerhouse vocalist and guitarist of Small Faces and Humble Pie. So let's dive in. Stephen Peter Marriott, born the 30th of January 1947 in Plashett, Essex, in England. Born at East Ham Memorial Hospital in London to parents Kay and Bill Marriott, he was born three weeks premature and weighed just four pounds four ounces and developed jaundice, requiring a four-week hospital stay. Coming from a working-class background, Steve attended Moniga Junior School. His father Bill worked as a printer and later owned a jellied eel store, while his mother Kay worked at the Tate and Lyle factory. Bill, an accomplished pub pianist, bought Steve a ukulele and harmonica, which he taught himself to play. Steve showed early talent, busking for pocket money and winning talent contests at holiday camps. At 12, Steve formed his first band with friends Nigel Chapin and Robin Andrews, named The Wheels, later Coronation Kids, and finally Mississippi Five. They added Simon Simpkins and Vic Dixon to their lineup. A huge fan of Buddy Holly, Steve mimicked him by wearing large rimmed glasses. He wrote his first song, Shelia My Dear, inspired by his aunt. The band played local coffee bars and Saturday gigs at the Esseldo Cinema. Known for his hyperactive and mischievous nature, Marriott was infamous in his neighborhood for pranks and was rumored to have started a fire at Sandringham Secondary Modern School, which he denied. In 1960, Bill Marriott saw an ad for a new artful dodger in the musical, Oliver, at London's New Theatre and applied for his son without telling him. 13-year-old Steve auditioned with Who's Sorry Now, and Oh Boy, and was hired by Lionel Bart. He played various boys' roles for 12 months, earning £8 a week. Steve also sang lead vocals for the Artful Dodger songs on the official album, recorded at Abbey Road Studios. In 1961, the Marriott family moved to a council flat in Danes Close at Manor Park. After Steve's success in Oliver, his family encouraged him to pursue acting. In 1961, he was accepted at the Italia Conti Academy of Theatre Arts in London, with fees covered by his acting work. He quickly gained roles in film, TV, and radio, often cast as an energetic Cockney child. In 1963, he appeared in Heavens Above, with Peter Sellers and starred as a drummer in Live It Up, in 1963, and its sequel Be My Guest in 1965. Steve eventually lost interest in acting and returned to music, causing a family rift and leading him to leave home briefly to stay with friends. In 1963, Steve wrote Imaginary Love, and used it to secure a solo deal with Decca Records through agent Dick Reagan. His first single, Give Her My Regards, with Imaginary Love as the B-side, was released in July 1963 but failed commercially. That same year, he formed The Frantics, recording a cover of Move It, with ex-Shadows drummer Tony Meehan. Despite efforts to promote the song, it was never released. The band renamed themselves The Moments and supported acts like The Nashville Teens, The Animals, and John Mayall, gaining a loyal following and even their own fanzine, Beat 64. In 1964, The Moments performed 80 gigs and recorded a cover of The Kinks song, You Really Got Me, for the American market but it failed, and Steve was dropped for being too young. Briefly, he considered joining the Downliners sect. In 1965, he joined the Checkpoints, rehearsing James Brown songs and showcasing a fantastic soul voice. Steve, a heavy smoker, often played harmonica and used the band's lead guitarist's Red Fender Strat. The band performed around Essex, relying on drummer Gary Hyde's cues to coordinate their performances. On July 28, 1964, Steve first met his future Small Faces bandmates, Ronnie Lane and 16-year-old drummer Kenny Jones, while performing at the Albion in Raynham. After leaving the moments, Steve worked at the J60 Music Bar, where Lane visited to buy a bass guitar. They bonded over their shared love of R&B and became friends. Steve joined Lane and Jones to perform with the outcasts at the Earl of Derby in Bermondsey, where they got drunk, and Marriott destroyed the piano, leading to their dismissal. Steve, Lane, and Jones formed their own band, bringing in Jimmy Winston, later replaced by Ian McLagan. Named Small Faces, by Steve's friend Annabelle due to their short stature and mod culture slang, they quickly signed with Don Arden and achieved success with their debut single, Whatcha Gonna Do About It. Don Arden paid the band £20 a week and provided clothing accounts. On Boxing Day 1965, Arden moved them into a rented house in Pimlico, which became a hub for celebrities like Marianne Faithful and Pete Townsend. Steve wrote or co-wrote most of Small Faces hits. In 1984, he cited All or Nothing and Tin Soldier as standout tracks. He wrote Tin Soldier to win back model Jenny Rylance, who had briefly dated Rod Stewart before returning to him. 
After Stewart and Rylance's final breakup, Steve pursued her, leading to the song's success and their marriage in May 1968. Steve then moved into Beehive Cottage in Morton, Essex, and set up his Clear Sounds studio. After the success of Ogden's Nut Gone Flake, Steve wanted to bring Peter Frampton into the band, but they refused. Feeling creatively stifled and having grown apart from the band, Steve left on New Year's Eve 1968. Frampton later claimed that after Steve's departure, the remaining Small Faces members offered him Steve's spot, but he declined, saying it was too late. Ian McLagan disputed this account. In 1967, after a dispute over unpaid royalties, the Small Faces left Arden for Andrew Luke Oldham's immediate records, where they spent more time recording and less time playing live, losing the dynamic live sound that had made them famous. After leaving the Small Faces in 1969, Steve joined Humble Pie with Peter Frampton, Jerry Shirley, and Greg Ridley. The band gave Steve the creative freedom he lacked in Small Faces. Their debut album, As Safe As Yesterday Is, and the hit single, Natural Born Boogie, achieved UK success. Following immediate records liquidation, Humble Pie switched to A&M Records and shifted focus to the US market under new manager D. Anthony. Humble Pie toured the US extensively over three years, with 19 tours and albums like Humble Pie and Rock On benefiting from this. Their live album, Performance Rockin' the Fillmore in 1971, became their most successful release, with Marriott's vocals taking center stage. His increased prominence is said to have led to Peter Frampton's departure, replaced by Clem Clemson. Steve's personality reportedly worsened during the US tours, possibly due to excessive alcohol and drug use. He developed a cocaine and alcohol addiction, which was said to have contributed to his marriage breakdowns. Steve became a different person under the pressure of touring, often expressing a desire to quit but then changing his mind. His commitment to music was initially admirable, but as he became increasingly immersed in his home studio, his drug use worsened, straining his marriage. Jenny Rylance left him in 1973, unable to tolerate his addiction. By 1975, Humble Pie disbanded due to musical differences, financial mismanagement, and rampant substance abuse. Jerry Shirley later commented that the band's downfall was due to their drug use, poor business management, and the making of bad records. Steve believed D. Anthony had diverted band funds to promote Frampton's album, Frampton Comes Alive. Later after Steve's death, his second wife, Pam Stevens, alleged they received threatening calls warning them not to accuse Anthony of financial wrongdoing. She claimed that after confronting Anthony, they were summoned to a meeting with reputed mobsters, including John Gotti and Paul Castellano, where Steve was warned to drop the issue. Jerry Shirley, however, dismissed these claims as exaggerated, acknowledging only that Anthony had connections but rejecting the Mafia rumors as bollocks. Steve released his debut solo album, Marriott, in 1976 and returned to Britain. He married Pam Stevens on March 23, 1977, after their son Toby was born on February 20, 1976. With Humble Pie's funds depleted, Steve resorted to stealing vegetables from a nearby field, and formed the Steve Marriott All-Stars with ex-bandmates. He met the notorious Ronnie Cray while O'Leary managed him. Steve was considered for Mick Taylor's spot in the Rolling Stones but was blocked by Mick Jagger after overshadowing him during the audition. Keith Richards favored Steve, but Jagger's concerns about his potential dominance kept him out of the band. In 1976, a court ruled that Arden owed Small Faces £12,000 in unpaid royalties. Arden made one payment and then disappeared. Encouraged by the success of re-released singles, McLagan, Jones, and Steve reformed Small Faces with Rick Wills replacing Lane, who had multiple sclerosis. The band released two unsuccessful albums, Playmates in 1977, and 78 in the Shade in 1978, before disbanding. Steve made no profit from the Reformation, used his earnings to settle old management contracts, and was forced to sell Beehive Cottage and move to a small house in Golders Green. In late 1978, Steve learned he owed £100,000 in back taxes from his humble pie days. Believing manager D. Anthony had handled it, he was advised by O'Leary to either leave Britain or face prison. Steve sold his Golders Green home and moved to California. There, he formed band The Firm, with Leslie West, but the band broke up due to visa issues and royalty disputes. Steve ended up broke and collecting glass bottles for money. In 1980, Steve, needing money, reformed Humble Pie and recorded, Full for a Pretty Face with Jerry Shirley and new members Anthony Sooty Jones and Bobby Tench. They secured a recording deal and released, On to Victory in 1980, and Go for the Throat in 1981, enjoying moderate success and touring the US. 
However, in late 1981, Steve faced personal troubles, including a failing marriage, a wrist injury, and a suspected ulcer. The new Humble Pie lineup broke up while opening for Judas Priest. In 1981, Steve, eager to see Ronnie Lane who was now in a wheelchair, proposed a collaboration. They recorded an album, Magic Midgets, with Lane, and others. However, Lane's illness prevented touring, and the album was shelved. Steve and Lane offered the album to Clive Davis, but Steve withdrew it, citing the need for touring, which Lane couldn't manage. The album was eventually released later in 2000. Steve then returned to the New York club scene. For the next 18 months, Steve toured with Jim Leverton, Goldie McJohn, and Fallon Williams, playing small faces and humble pie songs. After McJohn left, the trio became the Three Trojans. Steve's marriage ended when his wife discovered he was expecting a child with Terry Elias, a Canadian woman he met during their separation. In 1983, Leverton was replaced by Keith Christopher, now with Leonard Skinner. Steve cycled through several guitarists, including Tommy Johnson and Phil Duck Dix, as Humble Pie toured the US. Their final US show was in Marietta, Georgia, on New Year's Eve. In early 1984, Rick Richards replaced Dix, but after a brief stint in the studio with Eddie Offord, Steve returned to the UK. Accepting his marriage was over, Steve returned to the UK. Homeless and broke, he stayed with his sister Kay. He formed band Packet of Three, playing pub gigs and insisting on cash payments to avoid the inland revenue. In 1984, Aura Records released the album Packet of Three, later reissued as Steve Marriott Live at Dingwall's 6.7.84. Steve rekindled his friendship with Mann and Piercy, and they rented a house together. Piercy gave birth to their daughter Molly May on 3 May 1985. With her help, Steve reduced his drinking and drug use. His sister Kay noted, Steve would stop drinking for months at a time, he was very strong-willed. In 1985, Steve continued touring with Packet of Three in Canada, the US, and Europe. During Live Aid in 1985, the Phoenix Modernist Society joined mod revival bands and 1960s stars to record All or Nothing for the band Aid Trust. Kenny Lynch persuaded Steve to participate, and the single was released as The Spectrum. In 1985, Steve ended his relationship with Piercy after meeting Tony Poulton at a Packet of Three gig. Due to financial issues, he jokingly renamed the group Steve Marriott and the Official Receivers. Marriott and Poulton moved to a rented cottage in Arxton, which was used for location shots in the BBC series Lovejoy. Steve became well-known locally, often seen at the pub opposite his home. He was known for his eccentric behavior, playing pranks and borrowing glasses from the pub while wearing trainers and a dressing gown. Later in life, Steve grew wary of fame and big record companies, turning down lucrative offers from EMI and others. This attitude led to resentment within his band, Packet of Three, which eventually disbanded. At 39, Steve faced health problems, was overweight, and had a scruffy appearance, a far cry from his 1960s mod icon image. He still used drugs, but less than before. He enjoyed reading, with favorite authors including Stephen King, Philip K. Dick, and Noel Coward. In May 1988, Steve began rehearsing with a band from Leicestershire, the DTs, later called, Steve Marriott and the DTs. Despite being out of the public eye, Steve received various project offers. He declined Andrew Lloyd Webber's request to record for Evita after getting drunk at the meeting. He did record, Shaking All Over, for the low-budget horror film Noor, Food of the Gods 2 in 1989, viewing it as easy money. Trax Records then asked him to record a solo album, resulting in, 30 Seconds to Midnight, recorded at Alexandra Palace. Steve used the earnings to buy a narrowboat. On July 14, 1989, he married Tony Poulton at Epping Register office and they hosted a party at their cottage. During this time, Steve reconnected with Jim Leverton and formed Steve Marriott's next band. After some members left due to financial issues, they reverted to the name Packet of Three. By 1990, Steve was playing around 200 gigs a year. Frampton flew to Britain and proposed reforming Humble Pie for a one-off album and reunion tour, offering enough money for Steve to ease his workload. Steve agreed and flew to Frampton's LA studio on January 27, 1991. They began writing songs, but Steve soon changed his mind and returned home. Two songs from this effort, The Bigger They Come, and I Won't Let You Down, with Steve on vocals and guitar, appeared on Frampton's Shine On, a collection. A third song, Out of the Blue, featuring both, was on Frampton's first solo album after Marriott's death. A fourth song, An Itch You Can't Scratch, appears on various unauthorized compilations, but its recording details and Frampton's involvement remain unverified. 
Personally, Steve's first wife was model Jenny Rylance from 1968 to 1973. In 1975, he met American air hostess Pam Stevens, and their son Toby was born in 1976. They married after Toby's birth. The song, Toe Rag was about Toby, who guessed it on the original demo. Steve's third wife was Tony Poulton, married from July 1989 until his death in 1991. Steve had three daughters, Leslie, born to Sally Folger before he became famous, later known as Sarah Lisa Folger, Tonya, with Canadian Terry Elias in 1984, and Molly May, born in 1985 to Manon Piercy. Molly May is known as singer Molly Marriott. On April 19, 1991, Stephen Poulton flew home from the US after recording with Frampton. They argued throughout the flight and later that night with Steve drinking heavily. Whilst both staying overnight at a friend's house, Steve left for home alone, and at 6.30 a.m. on April 20, a fire broke out at his cottage. Firefighters found Steve dead, likely from smoke inhalation after lighting a cigarette in bed. The inquest ruled it an accidental death, with Valium, alcohol, and cocaine in his system. Jerry Shirley said, he was the most talented person I worked with. He should be in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Steve's funeral on April 30, 1991, included mourners like Kenny Jones, Peter Frampton, and Terence Stamp, with wreaths from David Gilmore and Rod Stewart. Thank you for joining us on this journey through the life and death of Steve Marriott. His powerful voice and indomitable spirit left an indelible mark on the world of rock music. If you enjoyed this video, please like and subscribe for more stories about the legends of music. Until next time, take care and bye for now.